agus fáta gutri shasked in program ek BBC Alba ha dalga kreer skill gan in bora nich ingentach an in sales sports na halabe. Is me shay ona Valentine agus hami tolly chirag vel agus ur er in tofa jerica noch in click their bali na strathclyde sirens agus the Scottish thistles Emily Nicol. I program na hei gan noch. Clinici Vokati Reid Siegi Shiga in Kori Shavai Koltoch of Viak Nagamakan Olympkoch and a Tokyo. Agus Bishni Brainery Christina Nikanich, a Ellen Lewis, a Huelsen Unius Loya Ria Volant and Gute Ian Grot Air Bicycle. Emily, welcome to 360. Thanks, have for having me. And it's so good to actually have you on the sofa this evening because you were one of our feature guests back in season one almost a year ago so it's actually yeah. I know a lot has actually happened in yeah. a year but it'd be good now that we've got you on the sofa this week just to hear about your journey into netball and actually how you got involved to the level of where you are today yeah I mean it's been quite a whirlwind and I always still think of myself as a young one in the squad and now I'm one of the, <laughs> the oldest and um, so I just I came from Bigger which is a quite a country town and it's all about rugby so Everyone's always thought I'd be a rugby player, but I had this passion for netball that I had a PE teacher that was just really fortunate that, that was her passion. Um, so just kind of played through school and things like that. Went to university um, at Edinburgh and they have such a good university programme, so got to be part of that, which was brilliant. And then it was um, there was a Scottish sport um, run like a representative team. Um, was doing trials for that and the national coach at the time, Gail Pratt, I was watching. Then like the next day got an email to say I'd been selected for the national team, so... It was just such a whirlwind and could I even do it? Could I manage it? Was I good enough? And within six months of my first cap and now been to Commonwealth Games and a World Cup. So it's just, just that a bit is mad. That's amazing. Yeah. So that initial email, yeah. was that just totally out of the blue? Did you expect anything from that? No, like I just couldn't believe it. And even once I got it, you know, you just feel the pressure of, am I actually good enough? And then, you know, your family are saying, well, they wouldn't pick you if they didn't think you're good enough. But I'm such a netball geek, even though I play it, I'm still such a huge fan of it. So just to be involved like, was just such an honour and just absolutely love it. So it was really good to get it. <laughs> that is amazing. And actually, tell us a bit about the last year as well, because since we had you on <laughs> the show yeah. in September, a lot's happened. I mean, how have things been going with the Sirens and actually also Scottish Thistles too? It's actually been such an exciting time for Scottish netball at the moment. And we're really fortunate with the government guidelines and things to be able to train earlier. So. I think a lot of us, you know, you're just in a routine, you go to training and then having lockdown was just such a shock to all of us. So we couldn't train together and we're just, we always see each other every day and then to not see each other was such a shock. So when we were allowed back into the environment, it just kind of made us all realise how much we loved it and to be around each other. So um, we got to have our Super League um, run from February to June. So just being able to travel every weekend, although it was a bit of an annoying to travel, like just having actually the privilege to get out of Scotland, go down, play our sport that we love and actually get really good results was just amazing for us. And with Thistles, it's been a bit delayed getting together, but now we're finally together. It's just like there's so many exciting plans coming up for the next year. So great to get Tams on board and things like that. And yeah, just a really good place for the sport at the moment. I know it feels like quite a long time ago, but just going back to what you're saying about lockdown, was how was that for you in terms of netball because I know, was that something that, did you, I don't want to say fall out of love with it, but did you struggle with it at that point? I think at the start, we all just didn't really know what place we were in. We didn't know what was happening with the league. And, you know, all of a sudden you're just going online with your teammates. And I mean, netball, you need another person to pass to. So our coaches did a really good job of trying to keep in touch with us and set programmes for us. But, you know, it'd have like my mum out in the street throwing a ball out that she couldn't really catch. So she tries, <laughs> tries her best, bless her. But... I guess at times you were questioning like, oh, like, what, do I need to do that session today? Or, but a lot of us like, um, you're like on iPhones, just like do our sessions together, like even just so we couldn't see each other, but we would just talk to each other through it. And that was the way to get through it. But I think everyone had times where you were like, oh, I've had enough. And then like the times that you enjoyed it. So it was quite hard, but I guess we knew the end goal was hopefully we're going to get back to be able to play. So that kept us going. And you must be feeling good about it now. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> I think also... It's allowed us to focus on things that we might not normally have focused on during the season, like when you're too busy, but like you can do loads of mobility stuff. And then when we can get into the season, like I think we were just so focused on, right, this is so precious. We're so privileged to be able to do this. It set us up in such a good mindset for the season going ahead. Do you think that's, has it been a change in mindset in the whole squad then? Because actually when the league started post lockdown, the sirens were playing so well. And I know, it, so it was a, a sixth place place finish you won 10 of your games out of 20 but actually the previous season you finished ninth yeah. it was eighth before then so actually 
you have come a long way and there's been so much chat about the sirens yeah. from last season. I know it's, I've been a siren since the first season, so I've seen it all and there's not many of us left that have done it. I think there's three, only three of us left that have been in the team every year. So having gone, there's been some really tough seasons and when you get losses, it is really tough and there were blowout games as well at times. So for us to come into this season, I think I remember in the pre-season game, literally getting told like, think of everything, like you have to win everything. So if there's a loose ball, you're going to win it. Like just even getting out in court first, like you've got to win that and just taking those small steps to remind yourself like, you want that winning mentality. I think it totally built up through pre-season. And then we just thought, right, wh why not us? Like, why can't we do it? And for me, my very first game in the Super League ever was against Wasps. And it was just, they were such a good team and it was so scary. And this year we drew against them and then beat them. And that win for me was just <laughs> the best thing ever because I held them as the pinnacle because that was my very first opportunity. And then to see the growth of the squad and then having new people in and just seeing how confident we were that we, there was no doubt that we could go out and win in the changing room and I think that mentality has really helped us like take leaps and bounds forwards. That's amazing. Well, we're very excited to actually see how you get on this season. Yeah. Here's Ara Jackin and Chachkin's colleague Katie Reid. She has a clue and a karate, Mr. Hyundai Iga Kanuig. Gare he spores and a davila secure jig, my first year gimmert. This barak for an och ein schach, who skip a vretting is on a gimmick in Olympic och, immer shahana gukyaun an in Tokyo. Like Bra Animoch for Skip of Rating, Rach Kitty V to Hula Peace Janaringoch, I can make an Olympic Och and a Tokyo. It was a bit of a shock to be going in the first place for me. Um, so, yeah, just um, try to take it all in, soak it all up. And um, yeah, there was, there, was, there was worry before about not, there had not been any crowds and spectators and things, but we created our own atmosphere. Um, the, the Olympic Village was, was amazing. Like, everyone was, was buzzing about. About competing and um, just being part of part of the team, really. Um, team GB did a great job um, in our block. It was all set up so we could like support each other and watch on the TVs and stuff. And um, yeah, and then like at, at the actual competition, it's there's always a good buzz anyway. Everyone's always excited to race, and your teammates support support you. And um, we were we were able to like sit in the stands and support support the rest of the team. So um, yeah, like in it was, it was a bit strange, like you didn't really even notice there weren't spectators because you're so like, you're so focused on what you're doing and you, you don't really notice it. So um, yeah, it was great. It was a, a fantastic experience. Um, yeah, I loved it. It was a lot of fun. In Saas and the Karate of Dorshach, Louis Katie Anuerson got a good let time for talent transfer. Programme a good and real to say the I think it was 2014. Um, there was a... UK sport funded program called Girls for Gold. Uh, it was a talent transfer. There's been quite a few of them like across other sports, but this was, yeah, for canoeing because because Tokyo was going to be the first time that women's canoe was going to be in the games. They they made this this campaign up because there wasn't there's was a, a really low um, participation um, level in, in Britain. So it was like oh, I'll try and get someone to the games. Um, so yeah, I um, was at uni at the time. Uh, I was doing karate. Did karate. Pretty much my whole life, but yeah, pretty much my whole life. Um, and I thought oh, I'll just apply apply for this. Had no, literally had no idea what sprint canoeing was. Um, I just was attracted to the basically just pushing yourself, see how far you can go, the challenge. Um, yeah, and now I'm here. <laughs> so yeah, that was seven years ago. Um, and yeah, there's been it has been a journey along the way for sure. <laughs> Fa fame at Kitty a train of good crew or son of Gemich and Olympica. Let's grow his moon and after a nickel yard of Doshok, I can a course in Jerevi. Went to uh, Hungary in May, um, which was my um, qualifying event, and, and didn't make it. Uh, I just missed out by a place. Um, so I got home and was processing that, and my next competition is the Worlds at the end of the year. So that was kind of where my goal was. and. Um, changed all my training to, to peak then. And then, um, yeah, I think it was three, I think it was only two weeks, two weeks before, before I flew out to Tokyo, I got, my coach came up to me, he was like, um, 
the the Russians had done something with their qualifying, so they panned a spot back. Do you want to go? <laughs> I was like, Do you want to go? Of course, I want to go. <laughs> so yeah, I only um I found out two weeks two weeks before before the games that I was going. So um yeah, that was a sudden change to um to my plans and had to change change training a little bit. Like you couldn't. <sighs> You could you could change it, but it wasn't going to make a big difference at that point. You kind of what you had is is, is what you had, and that was what what you were going with. So um, it was a it was a whirlwind of a two weeks for sure, trying to get sorted. And the rest of the canoeing team were already out in in Japan. They went to a pre camp in Lake Kiba, um, which I wouldn't I wasn't able to go to just because of timings. Um, so yeah, it's just uh, tried to change things a little bit and and get ready to, to race again. Um, so yeah, it was a, a crazy few weeks. Um, and I think with COVID as well, just um, trying to oh, trying to um, stay safe was um, everything was starting to open up. Um, you didn't have to wear masks and stuff. And I was just like, oh, I had to, had to make sure I was getting on that plane. As you will be in the Gulli, but Katie could tell you that Groyimus Hushin called this kind of thing. Everyone's been through a lot, haven't they, over the past few years with with COVID and. I think everyone was just excited to be there, um, just to be to be doing their thing. We've waited so long, um, and ha- everyone's had very little competition, and that's why we do it. We do it to compete and um, to showcase our sport and things. So everyone was just, um, yeah, it was was on a vibe really. Um, yeah, and it's like you know you're surrounded by by uh, very famous people and people who do really well and. I guess legends. Um, so that was all. That was um. That was a good to be part of. And yeah, in the Team GB um, tower, there was like yeah, there's people coming in after like we won so many medals. Um, so there was always someone coming in with a medal, and it was just um, yeah, it was a really good, great atmosphere, and everyone was very um, supportive. And Team GB say like what like their kind of slogans like one team sort of thing, and you did you did you felt like you were part of part of it. Um, so yeah, it was um, yeah, it was really good to be part of. As she we began first, had Katie a gamas in the game in Olympic or kind of Paris, but a really adorous Belgian coaching. Well, Paris is is the next big big one. Um, but yeah, I'll take some time off, uh, reflect, and then yeah, like it's amazing being being an Olympian and being part of it. But I also want to I want to do well, and I want to you know like I want to be pushing for those medals. Um, so yeah, like I guess Tokyo was get to Tokyo would be would be a big tick, would be a bonus, I guess. And then but Paris is the one where where I want to, yeah, hopefully get a medal. Be uh, contending for the yeah, the top ranks. That'd be that's the one for sure. Emily, what a brilliant surprise finding out two weeks before the Olympics that you're going. You would drop all plans for that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Oh yeah, I think she would have been such a shock for her. Like I can't, she would have processed probably. She would have been the mindset of processing not making it, and then to get that, she must have just been overwhelmed. Absolutely amazing. I know that you were um, loving seeing them in action. Actually, just with how much, even you were saying about the core strength that it would take to actually do that. Yeah, I, I don't know how good I would be. I'm quite t- at tight hips, but just to see how much um, force they can put through that and hold that position, it was very impressive. It was interesting what Katie was saying about the kind of the atmosphere and the crowd not having that. How have you experienced that throughout the, the last season? Yeah, it was definitely strange and it was an unusual setup for us the way that our the league had done it, but they actually had a really good setup. It was all blacked out, so you almost felt like no one was missing. But once we moved to the Copper Box venue, it, you could see all the empty seats and it just felt a bit empty. But then we were lucky towards the end of the season to have some people in. But I think for us, it, it really made us create our own noise as a team and I think that maybe helped propel us to some wins because we knew we had to really like get around, it was just us, we had to do it. Um, but I know from our home venue, being at the Emirates, our fans are unbelievable and even we speak to some of the girls and other teams and they they don't, they hate coming to the Emirates because it is just this like amazing Scottish like crowd. So we can't wait to be able to get them back in because it is, it is amazing and you love it, especially you've worked so hard, you want people to see how much work you've done and I did feel for the athletes at Tokyo, but um, I think, you know, athletes are motivated enough that you can get yourself across the line, but it is that X factor that we all love. You'll be looking forward to getting them back yeah. in. <laughs> Definitely. And the other thing that Katie was talking about, which was quite interesting, was being, as an individual athlete, being part of Team GB, 
you must take so much from being part of a team, which you, you have been for so long. Yeah, I, I've always said I don't know how these individual athletes do it. And I think it is really nice when it gets to these bigger games that they are part of a team because I know I like we all rely on our teammates so much at training. Like there can be emotional things going on, selections, like you just need someone to talk to. And we see each other every single day. Like we know everything about each other. So like half the time we don't ever talk about netball. We're just talking about life, but you need that switch off and you know, need these people to understand like if oh, I'm being quiet, oh, that's unusual for Emily. So something's up with her. So I think it's amazing that they've all been able to celebrate success together and just really be together because I think I just myself know that I need my teammates to cheer me on and stuff. So it's amazing that they, as individual athletes, get these opportunities as well to be part of a bigger, a bigger team. Even probably having that during COVID as well, that must have been really important. Yeah, well, it was a, a connection. It was a network, someone to reach out to the, rather than just the people in your household, which I know everyone probably felt a bit suffocated by your friends and family that were just in your house. So just having that connection to reach out to someone, oh, how are you doing? Or even what training are you doing today? And to hold each other accountable. Sometimes you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, I've got the gym. Okay, I'm really tired and sore, don't want to go. But you're like, oh, well, I know that my teammates are in, so I need to get up and do it. And I think individually, it must be really hard because it's just yourself to motivate, to get yourself up. So I definitely feel very fortunate to have my teammates around me. Well, canoeing, it made its debut at the Olympics. This year, I know netball, it's looking like hopefully 2032 yeah. in Australia, it will make its Olympic debut. Is that something that you look at and think, finally, that is happening? Yeah, I think it's about time. And I've kind of been waiting for Australia to get the Olympics for a long time, because I thought if anyone can do it, it's going to be Australia. And it's been really nice that not only Australian netball have got behind it, but the entire world. There's been so many things on Twitter and social media about trying to get netball to Olympics. And, when I was at school at home ec, we had to do this cushion and <laughs> I thought I always thought I was going to the Olympics. I didn't know what I thought I was going to do and I made a cushion and it was when it was London 2012 and I, um, like my only goal <laughs> is what I said on the cushion. I was convinced I was going to go to the Olympics. So <laughs> for me, I just think it's like the pinnacle and I think what's special about the Olympics is it's not just your mainstream sports that get the attention, like rowing people, become, rowing athletes become superstars. And so I really think netball deserves its place there. And I think it would just really flourish. And especially in this year where it's so popular, I think the crowd would get behind it. And then also those watching from home could really connect to it. And everyone I speak to that comes and watches netball for the first time just can't believe the speed of it because they traditionally think of maybe what they did at school. So I think it would just really show the world what netball was about. And it's, yeah, it's about time and I'm so excited that hopefully it can happen. Well, 11 years away, there's still time <laughs> to get you there. We're going to make sure you're in yeah. top condition. I'm going to preserve myself. Yeah. <laughs> but even with the 11 years now, what does netball as a whole across the world, what does it need to do to kind of generate more people getting involved, more countries getting involved and actually then making it to the Olympics? Yeah, I think netball's in a really exciting and interesting place at the moment and I think it kind of has been for a few few years now when England won the Commonwealth Games at 2018. There's no doubt that was a huge catalyst for pushing the sport onwards and then we had well, kind of like a home games for us, a World Cup at Liverpool and to see the buzz and to feel the buzz was amazing and I think we now need to not just get netballer, netball fans and netballers engaged, but now we need to think about this wider, just the population. And um, I think the only way to do that is, you know, you have to see it to be it. Like you have to get it out on social media and, you know, sirens and we're really, we really back that. We've got our um, headlines, not sidelines campaign. And we just really think that it's really important for the sport to be out there. And female sport, and it doesn't need to just be netball, but all female sport, just to encourage the population to realise just how amazing it is. But I definitely think with netball, it would be, it's getting there, but there's a lot more. The more coverage we can get, the more shows we can be on, the more that people can hear about it. And, you know, when we get into a taxi and we're getting taken to training and they know who we are, they don't just think we're a university team. Like, that's what the stage we want to get to. When you go to primary schools, they could probably tell you half of the Scottish football team, but I want them to know, oh, Emily Nicholl plays for the Thistles. So we're going to get there. We're just taking our time and trying to build that momentum as we go. You must have, have you felt so much change already? And, and also you are part of the team that's kind of paving this way for the next generation who will come and play at future Olympics. Do you ever think about that? Um, I, it's a huge part of me as an athlete and ever since I kind of be a younger athlete as well, it's about giving back. And so like I, when I came at university, like I always wanted to go back to my high school and do sessions. And I think it's something that's really important that athletes carry through. So 
I am quite conscious of what I want to leave this sport in the best place possible whenever I leave, although I never want to leave, <laughs> so that the young ones do have it easier. And even there's girls in our squad now who have, when they started, like they say, they just can't believe the difference. Like the, even the support we have now is such a huge step forward from what they have. The professionalisation of the game is so much better, but don't get me wrong, we're still pushing. We want to keep pushing on. And I think it's so important to always question what can we do next? And I think every athlete should we want to make it better for ourselves, but also who's coming up next. And I think we have a big responsibility to do that. So fingers crossed we can keep doing that. Well, it's amazing to see that growth. And also Emily Nicholl, Olympics 2032. <laughs> we will see you there. Yeah, you heard it here. Anishka Lu Classica, Avinia Stil Yellen Loish, Acha and Ju, Furuch and Estrela, Askeloch Ingentach, E Christina Nichkanich, Agus Fochen Gurich, Huli Volans, and Gutei Ian Grotzen, Unia Slui Riev, Er Bicycle, Sean Mararainia. A solo cycle from Land's End to John O'Groats. Um, so the total distance for that is 839 miles um, with 10,000 metres of elevation. Um, the first time I heard someone doing that, I thought they're off, off their heads, you know, they're mad, you know, like yeah. I wouldn't even drive that. Why would you even try and cycle it? But then, kind of, the more that I kind of got involved in long distance endurance cycling, kind of going from 12 hours, 24 hours. Um, maybe that kind of just seemed like the kind of most natural progression. You know, people might think, well, how can you enjoy sort of riding your bike for that length of time? Um, but I think probably over that length of time, you don't ride as fast or as hard as you would do, say, maybe on a 10 mile or a 25 mile, 50 mile, 100 mile. Whereas the longer ones, you kind of just sort of sit and settle in um, get a good pace going like that. Um, and then I think that's what I kind of find the comfort zone. Um, that I can sort of push the boundaries in that kind of respect. But Christina Nich Kunich is on Fiachnith Clar in the Kunya at the land's end of Tayen Grot of Rishik. But Kuchet to Gau this carried to Quick Minachin and Unia Sloye. I shall be Davlina at Trenig that can skip at Eiche by a father can grow at Jeshub. Ach for Fisaiki Gafemi a Hulishian, a bit jidic cursed. Yeah, it's a strange sensation because, you know, I'd been. I had planned to try and do it last year, but then obviously with COVID restrictions, we couldn't. So I probably had another year of training under my belt. Um, so training-wise, I kind of felt confident that I knew that I had it in me. But you just don't know what's going to happen. You know, there's so many uncontrollables between the weather, mechanicals, roads, accidents. There's so much that's cancelled. The preparation for that really or that lead up to it, that was the most nerve wracking ever because, you know, you're waiting on the weather and then for the first couple of days you know we're seeing northeasterlies mm. so that's a complete no-no I mean you don't want to go starting off there into headwinds um but then once we kind of did decide on the date there when it looked quite favorable it was really exciting you know it was really just keen to get going but it was that kind of nervous exciting as well because you know the whole two years is really basically coming down to this two days now so it was basically putting everything into practice but a Hulushian and the North who knew the Gat Christina Land's End, Achva Fisaiche Gro Dala Fatter Eichbe, a do like a lot, it didn't clear. I mean, there was the whole like 51 hours, it was like a complete emotional and physical roller coaster. You know, one minute for the first six, well, for the first six hours, I'm loving it. You know, I'm really enjoying being on the A30, um, got a tailwind, got a busy stretch of road, got drafts. You know, I'm sitting there on 20 miles an hour in zone one, um, having to convince the team, you know, that I'm not over gassing it, that my heart rate's really low, um, I'm just sort of going with the conditions. And then a couple of hours later, hitting Bristol into torrential rain, um, getting into the hills, getting into the traffic, I'm thinking, oh, this is horrible. Um, but then seeing support in the road, that would really kind of just like cheer you up even for that time. And I mean, that's what really made it, it was seeing the support in the road that did, did have time to say that you were feeling though it would really sort of encourage you. Let Typhoon skip it, I guess what doing at Tover Arch. But Christina at Hursa goes an Unia Sluya of Rishuk, Agus and Rosh and Vicky and Che a Sluya Dir, a high school a doing his fat, his bicycle. I got into Inverness, um, and at that point it was still dark, um, so I knew that by the time I had to get to John O'Groats, it was meant to be for like 12 30. So I knew I had plenty of time, um, and then crossing over the bridge, but then seeing a sign saying John O'Groats 111 miles, 
so you think that you're on the final straight, but then it's like 111 miles. Um, so it probably really wasn't until well about 50 miles after I'd done Helmsdale um, and Benadale, and then one of the timekeepers had said, you know, I was probably about an hour and a half up on the record. Um, and then the team were like, you know, if you want to stop, if you want to sort of have a sleep and whatever, but I was just like, just keep going because you know we need to we've got the time there um, to make up for that. So it's probably really in the last 30 miles, kind of knowing that that other than any kind of mechanical or that I was just going to sort of completely conk, um, that, would probably, that would be so long for it. But you don't kind of let yourself believe it until, you know, you, you see that sign really. Because, you know, I've kind of visualised that so many times in my head, you know, coming in, in under record time um, and coming in and seeing so many people there cheering um, with cowbells and whatever there and just goosebumps and tears and just the whole emotion knowing that you know the whole two years that we worked for to do that you know it's kind of paid off and it was it was just yeah it was an emotional one Initially, Baker Nunya is a raw shahat, as Han Clara, Ian Kendok, Lishan Unia Kirkaturn Ued, as Coit Minachin, and Christina. A villa down on the Nish, fearing it Clark Nukrinia, Illa of Rishi. I wouldn't say go again, but you know, I do. It's, I think it's only a natural thing because you've got that high and then you've kind of got the low and you're kind of thinking, well, what now? Because you kind of you feel like your body's recovered, you're back on the bike, you want to do certain things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but it all comes down to sort of opportunities really what we have available because you know that we all work full-time um, you know I'm just a part-time cyclist really at the end of the day and um, but there are other kind of records and things like that I would like to attempt for next year and um, but then obviously that's the same that having the same support team that would be crucial for it. Well, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. 51 hours and five minutes, 839 miles. What an achievement. Yeah, I, I'm amazed at what she's done. I mean, I go on my spin bike for like a 40 minute session and have to break it into like, right, 20 minutes time rate, and then break it down into seconds and reps. Like I have no idea how she did that. That's incredible. Just the mental strength that you would have to take to do that is unbelievable. And and even keeping it together when you think you're on the home straight, like Christina said, and then she saw a sign for 111 miles. I <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know how you keep going, but again, it's like you said, it's the mental strength that it takes to do that. You, you, you can do it if you tell yourself you can do it. Yeah, and I think she will have done so much training and rehearsal for that. And she will just know, she'll have all those mental, she'll have whatever she does needs to go through the processes that for her, she's will tick them off and, for her, all she'll thought about is probably just one leg after another, like just keep going. So yeah, again, I don't know if I could do it, but absolutely incredible that she managed to do that. And Christina spoke about the nerves kind of gearing up for that. Is that something, how do you deal with that within netball? Do you still feel that now? Or is it to a point where you're, you're excited? It's like the adrenaline that you're ready to go or, or do you still get that? Head yeah, the game. I guess, I think as you go through your career, well, for me, I found it quite difficult at the start. I was I'm very, very, very nervous and it would kind of affect my performance probably about how nervous I was because I just so wanted to do well. Whereas now I think I've managed to find the right balance of, oh, it's good to be nervous, but at the same time, I've done everything I possibly can to be ready for that moment. And she'll have done the exact same. She'll have I've been out in so many training runs that she know at that moment there's nothing else they could do. She's got the support team behind her. All she's left to do is go out and do it. And sometimes for us, when it's been a while like so after lockdown and coming out for the first game again it is like oh my goodness like we're going to do it like this is it can I still do it so there is that nerves and excitement but you want to have that that gets you going it's that little bit that gets you over the line and that extra effort on court is just when you've got that wee bit of nerves so it's good to have but it's all about controlling it and you definitely learn that as you progress through your career I think. Yeah I was going to ask how did you find that balance but is it just a case like you say going through your career and learning how to cope with it? Yeah, and I think it's just experience, you know, getting put into really difficult games where, you know, it's a draw and, you know, the next pass, if, if you chuck the ball out, your team are going to lose. So there's so many things that I think experience teaches you and you don't realise at the time that you're becoming experienced. But now when I reflect back and in situations now, I think, oh, I don't know how I would have handled that at the very start of my career. And as you say, like, I would just be so so nervous about wanting to do everything right. And you, you now, I now know, like, I'm going to make an error, but it's fine. Like, as long as I just got on to the next job straight away, it's fine. And, 
I think it's just something, as I said, like you just really mature and learn. And, you know, I've worked with sports psychologists as well, and you just learn what works for you. Everyone's different, but you just have to find what works for you and go with it. Talking about reflecting back, how would you reflect back on the, the really big achievements in your career? Because we haven't spoken about it yet. You made your Commonwealth Games debut in 2018. You then had the Netball World Cup the year afterwards. That's two huge competitions in such a cl close, such a short space of time. Yeah. That must have been amazing. It was, and I remember waiting for the phone call to like say I was going to Commonwealth Games and just being so, I lived with another netball girl and we, she got the phone call before me and it was just so nerve wracking and just going away. I'd never been outside of Europe before either. So like going somewhere so far was amazing. A family traveled over and it was amazing. But I think for me, like the two experiences couldn't have been different from a Common Games to a World Cup. So I probably went to the Commonwealth Games as quite an inexperienced member of the team and was probably more there just to learn. Didn't really get much court time. So I actually found it quite mentally tough when I was over there because I was loving the vibe and the atmosphere, but actually wasn't actually going, wasn't doing the thing that I'd trained to do. So it was for me quite a struggle, but at the same time, you're part of a team, so you have to just put the face on and then you struggle with it and deal with it yourself. And then flip to a year forward, like it, the World Cup in 2019 for me was like the best two weeks of my life. And like, even for my family, like it was just the most amazing experience. And all of a sudden I was a starting player, played like full games, every game. So just even in a short space of time, a year, you can totally flip and all of a sudden I was now experienced. And, but, and at the time you then, when I look back, I think, oh, now I realise kind of what that 2018 games was for. Like it set me up and then, so I wasn't scared or nervous about what was to come when I was like, right, Emily, relying on you, like you need to go and do this. And you're like, well, yeah, I'm prepared for it. Like I've been there, I've done it and I'm ready. And every athlete's gonna, your journey isn't like this. It doesn't just become amazing and amazing. You, you've got things that, not necessarily setbacks, I don't like that, but just like, opportunities to learn let's call it or something like that it just you don't realize at the time and it's really tough but then you just learn and then it's when you have success you look back and realize the purpose of them so yeah amazing to have been to both of them so it sounds like you matured so much just in that short space of time so you probably do you feel like you're in a good place both mentally and physically hopefully with the view of the commonwealth games coming up next year yeah i Right now, touch wood, I feel like in the best like mental, physical space that I've been in a netball and I think I have just really learned. And I guess with lockdown, realising that it can just be taken away from you at any moment. So I promised myself before the Super League season that regardless of what happens, how much court time I get, I'm just going to go and enjoy it. And I think just taking the, I put a lot of pressure on myself to perform as all athletes do. And I think it's like taking that pressure off and literally just going and playing with passion has really helped my game. And I don't stress about things that aren't out of my control. I just control what I can control and then give up my own and see what happens. So yeah, there's been lots of learns throughout the time, but hopefully continue in this good space. But it sounds like you're feeling good about the future and your future within netball too. Yeah, I mean, fingers crossed, the body's feeling good, mind's feeling good. So I, I've always said I'll never put like a expiry date on my career. I'm just gonna keep going until my body says, I can't do it because I have such passion for it and the girls always tease me because I'm the biggest like netball fan for all the other teams and know about everyone and half of them don't but they just um for me I'm just going to keep going and it, I think when you stop enjoying it that's the time that you question yourself and say is this what I want to keep doing but right now there's nowhere else I'd rather be than at netball so I'll just keep doing it. <laughs> well it's amazing and it's so good to hear your passion and it's been so amazing to have you on the sofa this week, Emily. Thank you so much for joining us. Perfect. And we do look forward to following both the Sirens and the Scottish Thistles in the weeks, months and years to come. Well, she now is on programme as Shachin said, Mahang, though Emily Nicol or Sonny Vinam Kuchoks in studio. Jankin Shachin, well, she will lengthen three sheskit their YouTube. I guess gave she been programme Megira Gakin or I played a VBC. Fiachin be she've called her in an ach Yachin or Son Tulik Skilachin, we've won an ach Ingentach and in sports in the Halibut. Martian Live and Draft. <laughs>